Hi, this is uh, Richard Hall from uh, Stonehenge and the Astronomy Centre out at Stonehenge and we're going to be looking at the night sky in May. I guess as we get into the, I mean, you've all noticed how quickly the days are getting shorter, but of course for people who like to view the stars, it uh, uh, means that we can get out there a, a little earlier to have a look around. Now, the first thing I guess you're going to notice, and just about everybody will notice, is that even long before it gets dark, once the sun's gone down in, in the twilight sky, you're going to see a, a, a big bright star out there in the um, in the uh, west sky, western sky, in the, in the sort of southwestern sky, and that's the planet Venus. It's not a star at all. Venus, we call it the evening star because it's only ever seen either uh, just after sunset in the in the west or just in the dawn in the east. Um, in ancient times, people used to think it was exactly the same star, you know, uh, appearing and so on. Uh, but what it is is that Venus is closer to the um, closer to the sun than the Earth is, and consequently, we only see them at that point of time. You never see Venus in a dark sky, real dark sky, like you do uh, uh, Mars or Jupiter. So that's that's the evening star. Incidentally, um, Venus is is. F- becoming will become quite close to us when when you can actually see it with the unaided eye um like as a bright star so bright that even in a pair of binoculars it just looks like a big bright star but if you manage to catch it a, a little earlier uh, before uh, it gets really dark you'll actually be able to see that venus just like the moon has got phases on it i won't tell you what phase it is you have to go and check that out for yourself and have a look Anyway, as we begin to get dark, um, the first thing you'll notice is the Orion, a constellation of um, a winter, a summer sign, sorry, is now beginning to uh, drift towards the west, while the Scorpion, which is the sign of winter, rises in the southeast. This Scorpion is, particularly as you watch it rise up, particularly as you watch it rise up now, you'll see that it um, it does one of those signs that does actually look like a, a like it's supposed to look like you can see the tail of the scorpion there's a great hook in the sky and of course the polynesians this was the, the fish hook of maui right so but you have a look at it you can't miss it it looks like a gigantic fish hook sitting in the milky way and as it rises up the fish hook rises up as well okay now the southern milky way however passes almost directly overhead and our southern cross is at its highest point in the sky now I know some people have had different. When you've got a really uh, brilliant da- uh, night, it's a lot quite difficult for some people to determine um, uh, which is the Southern Cross up there. Because if you look around with so many bright stars, you can pick your eyes can pick out quite a few uh, crosses. Well, the easiest way to do that is first of all the Southern Cross is quite compact, made up of bright stars. But following behind the cr- the, the, the Southern Cross are the two pointer stars. And the brighter of the two pointer stars is Alpha Centauri. It's the third brightest star in the sky. So that's how it's the easiest way to pick out uh, what that is. Incidentally, Alpha Centauri is the nearest star system beyond the um, beyond the our own solar system. And it, through a telescope, uh, you, what you notice is that while it looks like a single star to the unaided eye, when you turn a telescope on it, lo and behold, you discover it's actually twin stars. And um, so that if you lived on a planet in the Alpha Centauri system, you wouldn't have one sun, you'd have two suns in the sky. Furthermore, just over recent times, our technology has got good enough so we can begin to detect planets around other stars, and we're already beginning to define planets around the Alpha Centauri system system but when you when you look at a, a star in the sky you can never just by looking at it know how far away it is unlike looking across the paddock where you're looking at sheep and cattle and so on where the brain's got some idea of how big an object is when you look at a bright star is it bright because it's close to us or is it bright because it is physically bright well unfortunately the star's uh, very enormously in in brightness and uh, this is a good example alpha centauri is actually a local star um, as i just mentioned two twin suns two stars very similar to our own sun but the other pointer star hadar right and incidentally alpha centauri is just over four light years away hadar is 525 light years away so this and this star appears bright in our sky because it is truly a bright star It's what we call a blue giant. It's actually 16,000 times brighter than the sun, but a long, long way away. 
Interestingly enough, the very closest star to the solar system can't be seen without a telescope. This star is Proxima Centauri. It's a little faint red dwarf star which you can only see with a telescope. And in fact, uh, it is the most common type of star in the galaxy. 70% of all the stars are red dwarfs and not one of them can we see with the unaided eye. So there you are. So Proxima is the nearest one. Now, if you look out to the west of the Southern Cross, you'll see what appears to be a bright uh, patch in the sky. Um, on the, in the Milky Way. It's quite noticeable if you're out in the Wairapa where we get really nice night skies. Well, this is a, a nebula. It's, a, it's what we call the Great Nebula in Carina. And I just mentioned Hadar was 525 light years away. This Great Nebula, which is a, a cloud of glowing gas and dust, is actually 9,000 light years away. And um, located near the... Uh, Centre of that is shrouded in gas and dust is the brightest star known in the galaxy. Now this star is known as Eta Carina, and um, you can't see it very well with the ADI on the ADI at the moment because it, it, there was a big explosion on it on in 1843, and there's a cloud of uh, dust and gas uh, uh, ejected around it at the moment. But at that time, it, it, back going back to 1843, it became the second brightest star in the sky, even though it's 9,000 light years away. What we do know about this star is actually, like Alpha Centauri, it's a binary star. It con consists of two suns, but unlike the Alpha Centauri, which is made up of sun-like stars, what we've actually got is two stars, one which has got 120 times the mass of the solar system and the other one 60 times the mass. And they orbit around each other in a period of just under uh, over five years. The brighter of the two stars is three and a half million times brighter than the sun. And it is, in fact, it's so big and so bright that this thing is highly unstable and is subject to massive explosions, and sometime, probably within the next 1,000 years, it's going to completely destroy itself in a titanic explosion known as a hypergiant, a hypernova. And um, what's going to be left of it? Nothing but a black hole, a bottomless pit in space. But when that explosion occurs, you, everyone around the world's going to notice it because it will turn our night sky into broad daylight. And we're just hoping at this stage that 9,000 light years is far enough away not to worry too much about it. So there you have it. That's the brightest star out there at the moment. Um, and when we come back, we're going to be looking at the planets, other planets that we can see in our sky. But right now, uh, um, we're going to be listening to a little bit of music by Jim Walmsley, and this one is called Galaxy Rise.
Hi folks, you're back with Richard and uh, Night Sky and I know those that have been watching a bit of television and being able to see some of those wonderful images of things like that hypernova and so on. Anyway, getting back to our night sky that we can see in our sky at the moment, uh, in, for here from the wire wrapper, there's some nice big bright planets around, so I'd, this is what I'd like to talk about. First of all is that if you look to the southwest, uh, you can see two bright stars in the sky. Um, You can see two bright stars in the sky. Now these are the stars Sirius and Canopus and they are the brightest stars in the sky. They're fairly easy to pick so if you look towards the southwest you know that's you'll see these two stars and anything that's brighter than those two stars in the sky is no, st is no uh, star at all. Now if we look to the southeast where the scorpion is rising up which we were looking at earlier on just above the Scorpion is another but fainter zodiac constellation called um, uh, the uh, Scales, Libra. And in that you'll see a big bright star that appears to, out once Venus has set, outshines every other star-like object in the sky. Well, that is the planet Jupiter. Yeah, and, uh, uh, of course, Jupiter is the biggest planet in the solar system, uh, bigger than all the other planets put together and it's above the horizon for most of the night it we actually pass closest to jupiter on may the 9th and at that time it's going to be 37 minutes light minutes away i keep on using the term light year and light minute that's the distance light travels in a year so when i just said a little while ago that we were looking at hadar which was uh, over 500 light years away we're seeing hadar as it was 500 years ago you see, and the further we look into space, the further backwards in time we look. So um, we never see the universe as it is, but as it was. Well, uh, Jupiter's in our solar system, but even so, um, it's 37 light year minutes away. That means that when we see Jupiter, we look at it for a telescope or whatever, we're seeing Jupiter as it was uh, 37 minutes ago. And this, of course, uh, creates a bit of a, a problem when we're, we're talking about um, uh Communications when we're out there in the in the uh, when we're out there with space people and so on. Um, so if we sent some people out to Jupiter, if you're going to say a, send a message to them and say, "Well, okay, hi, how are you guys?" That that message would take 37 minutes to get there. And if they replied straight away and said, "Yeah, we're fine," it would be another 37 minutes before you'd hear that. So you could hardly have a conversation with people around Jupiter because there would be an, an hour delay between when you asked a question and when you actually got a answer of course as you go further into space this will get worse and worse uh, alpha centauri the nearest star if you phone up so hey how are you guys doing well it'd be almost nine years before you got a reply you can forget about hadar by the time you uh, got a reply from hadar it will be uh, over a thousand years will have elapsed so uh, I'm afraid the ideas of galactic empires that you see on Star Trek and that are just not feasible because nobody could actually keep in contact with each other to actually run an empire in the first place. Anyway, 37 light minutes. How What's that in dist actual kilometres? Well, at 666 million kilometres. Now, Jupiter itself is almost like a, um, well, a miniature solar system. Uh, it's actually got something in the region of 60 moons. And when you look at Jupiter, we never see its surface. And I can always remember as a kid looking at uh, pictures of what astronomers thought it was. There's no solid surface on Jupiter at all. It's actually just like the sun is made mostly of hydrogen and helium. So if you le leapt into it and tried to land on it, you'd go through this dense atmosphere and it'd get denser and denser till eventually you'd hit an ocean. But it's an, a worldwide ocean, but not an ocean of water. It's actually a liquid of liquid hydrogen, all right? And that ocean is 20,000 kilometres deep. And at the bottom of that is a core. The surface of that is actually metal, but not, again, not like iron as we know it. It's actually me metallic hydrogen. Of course, you could never reach there because the pressures are so great that every known substance, including metal, flows at that sort of pressure. So Jupiter is very much like a, a, another sun with its 60 moons and four of them you can see quite easily with a pair of binoculars. So you get your binoculars out, depending where they are, you should be able to see uh, strung out 
four other little tiny bright stars. Sometimes you might only see, say, say three of them because one's actually on the other side of Jupiter or too close to it. And these uh, these moons were discovered by um, Galileo, the first telescope he ever used, and they are known Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. Now, I talk about them being moons, but they're bigger than our moon and uh, they are literally little planets. And don't imagine them to be like our moon, because when we actually look at uh, them through the big telescopes, we discover that they're the most awesome worlds of all. Io, for example, is the most volcanically active world in the solar system. There's never less than three volcanoes erupting, erupting at any one time. Europa is a world of ice, but... Beneath the ice is evidence of living things down there. So we've got a lot of things to discover uh, in the um, in the coming years when we begin to explore this planet. Now, if we look below Scorpius, is this is the constellation of Sagittarius, which is rising up. And uh, here we're going to find two more planets. Rising up around about nine o'clock, you will see a bright star. That's actually the planet Saturn. Uh, of course, the Lord of the Rings. and But Saturn will not be well placed in our sky to observe maybe until next month. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. And the other planet which is going to be rising up at 10 o'clock, it's dead easy to pick out because it's reddish in colour, is the planet Mars. And we're going to be making a close approach to Mars in a couple of months' time. So we'll talk a little bit more about Mars later on. Anyway, um, that's the brilliant planet. So you've got Venus in the early evening sky. Then we've got Jupiter. And then rising up behind Jupiter is Saturn and Mars. So you've got quite a few of the big bright planets visible to the unaided eye. Anyway, we're going to have a little bit of a break now and some more music. And when we come back, well, we're going to be talking about some of the other interesting things that are happening, such as the great cluster of galaxies in Virgo.
Hi, hi, this is Richard back here uh, with the night sky. And just to finish off uh, today, what I wanted to talk about is uh, number one is that uh, we, if you look away from the Milky Way, uh, we look out towards uh, sort of barren piece of the sky. And it's actually where Virgo is and so on. And But actually, this is a window into the greater universe. And if you've got large telescopes, which we do have out at uh, Stonehenge, then suddenly you begin to explore the, the universe beyond our own Milky Way. Another thing I should mention also is that uh, after midnight, uh, you're going to see a lot of meteors. Uh, there's a, we do every now and again as we orbit around the sun, uh, we bump into a debris that's been left behind by a comet, in this case Halley's Comet, and it produces a meteor shower. Well, in May, we've got the, 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 the best meteor shower we normally see from the Southern Hemisphere. It's known as the Eta Aquarius because they're coming out of the constellation of Aquarius. And you should see about 50 meteors an hour. And these peak on May the 6th. Now, what I should also tell you about, while we've got a little bit of time left, is that as uh, uh, we're building an astronomy centre out at Stonehenge, as from th this year, we started to run a regular astronomy evening for p the public on the third Saturday of each month. And the next one we've got coming up, which is a, is a what we call Trek Around the Cosmos, is on Saturday, May the 19th at 7pm. Uh, at 7 p.m. Saturday, May the 19th. And all of these things we've been talking about in the sky right now, uh, hey, we're going to be able to have a look at those. We're going to, even if it's the sky's not too good, even if the sky is not too good, we'll, we'll be able to put them all up, okay? So what I'm saying is that that's on that Saturday, May the 19th, come out and see the planets and Virgo at Stonehenge. Bye-bye for now.